Shabbat Shalom. Good morning to everybody. This is Bill Bullock and here we are at the Biblical Lifestyle Center. I'm going to be speaking to you for a few moments today. Speaking to you about the Parsha known as Re'e. This is Deuteronomy 11 and chapter 11 verse 26 through uh, chapter 16 verse 17. And so I encourage you to join with us today to uh, let us know where you're listening from. We want to just thank you so much for the privilege of letting us share your Sabbath with you and uh, enjoy these times of download from the creator of the universe's throne. Uh, we are courtiers of a great king. Uh, we are uh, residents of a great uh, kingdom uh, enterprise and participants in that enterprise. So uh, again, gracious thank you to you all for letting me join with you. Uh, let us uh, enjoy this time together, uh, as little as it may be, or as great as you may think it might be. Uh, today we are talking about, as I said, Parsha Eh. The name in English uh, would be usually translated as Behold. It could also be translated Observe or Discern. But the key factor is pretty clear. It has to do with your vision. It has to do with lifting up your eyes, our eyes as the case may be, and seeing things in a different perspective, from a different perspective, maybe with a, a bit of a helicopter view. Uh, really, it's, it's higher than a helicopter. The idea we're trying to get into that Moshe, who is writing this to us and speaking these things over us, is trying to get to is that we are to be looking at the earth and the things of the earth and the people of the earth and the situations and all the circumstances of the earth that we face, not through human eyes, but through eyes that have been lifted into the courts of heaven and are therefore looking, as it were, down, downward, uh, from an eternal perspective, from a greater vision, greater imagery perspective, with more knowledge and understanding than people who live here in the flesh who live in out of their emotions and responses and uh, hormones and instincts and appetites and urges. Do you see, he's saying, behold, this is your time. Before you cross over the Jordan, before you step into the next phase of your uh, encounters with, with life, before in, in our situation you enter into a new uh, biblical year, a Hebrew year at least, a uh, Torah year, Open up your eyes and let the Holy One enhance your vision. And so here we are. Today is a very special day. It's the 30th of the month of uh, moon cycle of Menachem Av, the fatherhood of, the, of, of comfort, the father of comfort. So tonight at sundown, we believe, will be the rising of the new moon, the Rosh Chodesh, for the sixth month of the biblical year, the month called Elul. I'm checking on, I'm there, I'm here. So the month of, of Elul, is a very special month. Uh, it, it is the last moon cycle prior to the beginning of the seventh month. And the seventh month of the biblical year is when we have three divine appointments. They're called High Holy Days, uh, typically known in English as Rosh Hashanah, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. But the uh, Hebrew would be of the Yom Teruah, the Day of Breathing or Blowing. Uh, then Yom Kippur, the day uh, it's called atonement, but the covering of uh, rising again, facing uh, up to our death and rising up again as resurrected new lives. Uh, and then finally the Feast of, of Sukkot, or Tabernacles as it's called in English, a time of celebrating the, the kingdom of heaven to come, the great, uh, the, the great uh, messianic realm uh, reign uh, to come. So that's what we, we do over the next, uh, the next month. We have uh, about 30 days now to prepare for it, and that will be an important thing. But what Moshe is doing in Parsha in uh, Deuteronomy 11, 26 through 16, 17, is doing what I call uh, releasing his come up here and see what I see discourse. There's a section in this great speech on the plains of Moab that he's speaking to us, and, and I call this section the come up here and see what I see discourse. It's part of a greater download, the greater download being what we've talked about in the last few weeks, which is how to build a kingdom of heaven scented society on earth. Now, if we're going to do that, if we're going to be participants in this grand plan for the redemption of mankind as a species, for the restoration of creation in all of its different areas, 
to its original intended state of beauty and fruitfulness and shalom. If we're going to do all that, we're going to need to be able to come up where Moshe is, where he sits, where he, where he interacts with the Holy One, and to see what he sees. See what the Holy One wants us to see beyond what our flesh and our pseudo-intellect think is reality. So we have this, this part of our call. The next thing we'll, we'll talk about is then the, the whole issue of what the times and the seasons are. Uh, this is a kingdom calendaring notice. Take, please take note. Uh, some of you may think, uh, if you're out of the traditional religious traditions, that this is not relevant to you anymore. But I would just suggest you give it a shot and see if there's something in it that you didn't maybe realize. So, as I said, we're getting ready to uh, for, for Rosh Chodesh Elul, the, the day of the new month, the sixth month of the biblical calendar. That will be tonight. Uh, our well, and, and to, that, that our nation is, is celebrating the fact that in a very special way, unlike the rest of the year, during this 30-day period or so, the king is in the field. That is a traditional saying about this time of the year. It's not that the king is not omnipresent. It's not that our, the Holy One is not everywhere at all times. But there are certain times of the year, certain seasons he has programmed into the earth time that we know that uh, call us, draw us closer to him and inspire our, uh, and awaken our consciousness of him. And so when we say the king is in the field, it's not like he hasn't been in the field. It's like we just weren't aware that he was in the field. We didn't have the consciousness of the nearness, how close he is in the field. And so in that regard, I will do something I almost never do on these broadcasts. I've never done it ever, as a matter of fact, on these broadcasts. But I, I want to tell you about a resource that, uh, that I have written. Uh, it's called The Late Summer Journey of the Awestruck Heart. It's part of a greater Awestruck Heart series. My call, feeling is that I, all of human beings, all those who are interested in following the Holy One, need to awaken, reawaken what was born in them as the Awestruck Heart. It's that sense of awe and wonder at the Holy One. And so uh, in our heart, we have this uh, sleeping uh, powerful force, this awestruck heart, and this is the late summer journey to the season. If you wish to look at it, it's a 30-day devotion for the month of Elul, which begins tonight at sundown. I really encourage you to take a look at it, at least. Uh, the, uh, this is available uh, online through the biblicallifestylecenter.org. That's biblicallifestylecenter.org, and you go to the publications page. Uh, but also, with this, since I'm here, I might as well tell you that if you look at the, uh, the Rabbi Son page of that same website, biblicallifestylecenter.org, you'll find all of the Torah settings that I do daily uh, on each Parsha in detail in an archived form. So you always have access to that. That's totally free. It's just something that the Holy One has given me over the course of 25 years of study, and I encourage you, if you wish, to take a look at that. Sign up for it. You get an email if you wish. But those are the, that's, that's all. That's all I've got to say about those things. The journey, late summer journey, the Austrian heart, and the daily studies. So what is uh, the month of Elul designed to do? It's called, to make, uh, it's called in Hebrew Teshuvah. English calls it repentance and uh, or turning of the mind. But taking Teshuvah is not turning away from things as much as it is turning to the Holy One and returning to Him and to His ways. It's not so much about what we leave behind. It's about where we go. And it's about that focus. He wants to make us united with him again. He wants to reconnect at the deepest levels and at the most heel levels, the place where we, uh, rubber meets the road and the, and the sand will meets the sand. So uh, this is a sort of a theme verse for the late summer journey of the Austrian heart and for our time. It's from Hosea chapter 6. Come, let us return. Shuv, ek teshuva, unto the Holy One. For he has torn us, but he will heal us. For he has stricken, but he will bind us up. And after two days, he will revive us. And he, uh, on the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. Let us know him and let us pursue knowing him. That's again Hosea 6, 1 through 3. Some theme verses for this season, this portion of, of Torah, but also for the uh, season of the Austrian heart and the month of Elul. Our job is to recenter, re, uh, 
to, to reset, I know that's a common word used in political terms these days, but to recenter, to reset our lives, and to refocus them on the, uh, the, 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 the idea of who the king is, and his throne, and his place, and his ways. I want to tell you that, again, this is the third week uh, of the after the consolation. I've got something popped up on my screen I've got to get rid of. There you go. From the after up, we, we are seeing uh, this uh, sort of developing, graduating each week, and this is the third of seven weeks. And this after up, which is I, uh, from, from Isaiah, again, everything's in the second part of Isaiah, it, it has these phrases in it. All your children will be taught by the Holy One, and great will be the shalom of your children. I hope you're catching it. This is part of the end game of the Holy One, beyond all the other people who teach us, or our children, or those who try to instruct or inform or, or indoctrinate our children. This is his promise in the latter days as we prepare for the kingdom to come. All your children will be taught by the Holy One and great will be the shalom of your children. Do you want shalom for your children? I know you do. You want peace. You want a sense of well-being and wholeness and wellness and fulfillment of purpose. Well, I know you do. So this is part of the, the end game to get us in that direction. To make a teshuva is our time to make turning. Go back to the Holy One in His ways and then all our children will be taught by the Holy One and great will be the, children, the, the shalom of our children. And then it, it goes on. Uh, the Parsha, the, the Haftarah says, Kol Kali, in every matter or accusation or in everything, there's no real, it says in, in English, every weapon uh, that's formed against you will come to nothing or not prosper. That's not really what it says in the Hebrew. It just says, Kol Kali, in, in, in everything, in every matter uh, that's formed against you, that comes against you, will come to nothing. It will not prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment, in Hebrew, Tarshit, it, you will cause it to, to be confused and go into to tumult and to, to dispute diversion. And it says this is the heritage, the nachala, the downstream portion of the servants of the Holy One. And their righteousness will be from me, says the Holy One. And he goes forward and concludes the after this week with these words. Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, l'chulamayim, come to the waters, come walk to the waters with me. And you who have no money, Come and walk and buy and eat. And yes, come and buy wine and milk without any money and without anything that you could barter. These are the promises of the latter days. And prepare us for this time. Prepare us for what's about to happen. Moshe has these five parsha, five sections of the Torah that he's going to use. And these five sections of Torah are going to prepare us for what I call the great Rubicon crossing, the Rubicon. Uh, that's a story from the legends of Rome, and I don't want to get into the details of the story, but there's an important time of crossing the Rubicon. Well, it's not the Rubicon he's preparing us to cross. It's the Jordan Rift Valley. Uh, Moshe has only a six weeks, uh, uh, 36 days, as it were, to prepare us to go beyond the, the journey uh, through the wilderness of the generation post-Exodus and to actually get us down in that valley and up, up the ascending the hill away from the Jordan River into the Promised Land, he has only six days, to, six weeks to prepare us for this Rubicon crossing, and he's using these five parshas of Torah that we're in, we're now in the the, 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 the first of a series that to will prepare us for crossing over into that great land. So everything that he will say to us over the next five weeks of parshas will be spoken with the, in decision, with the decision we're going to have to make at that great crossing time in mind. He knows what we're going to have to leave behind. He knows what we're going to have to take with us. He knows what we're going to have to draw forth from within us and from the Holy One's throne and the energy and the kedusha of that throne to be able to do what we're called to do as we make this great crossing. He's going to prepare us to decide between two dramatically different lifestyles and, of course, two dramatically different life focuses. These are going to be based on vision, what we can see. That's why I said it's, it's his uh, come up here and see what I see discourse. The Holy One, you see, wants the, the choice when we make it to cross that Jordan Rift Valley, to cross our Rubicon, as it were. He wants that choice to be an informed choice. He wants us it to be a choice that has been made after seeing 
and grasping, understanding, and intentionally eschewing all available alternatives. He doesn't want us to say, well, oh, I didn't realize I could have had that, I could have done that, or that this was the way the temptations were going to be. He wants us to know what we're getting into and count the cost before we cross the Jordan Rift Valley, before we cross our individual Rubicon. And so the next five parts of Re'e, Shoftim, Kitabo, Kitetze, and Nitzavim, they're all Moshe's way of making sure we understand the ramifications of whatever choice we will make. Let's sing our call to worship. If you know it, please join me. If not, just uh, close your eyes if you can and relax and enjoy. Baruch Hu et Adonai Hamborak Baruch Adonai Hamborak Leolam Vayed Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Asher vakarbanu mikol ha'amin V'natan lanu et torato Baruch ata Adonai Noten ha'torah And now open our eyes, O Holy One, that we may see wondrous things in your Torah, for we are but strangers in this earth. So do not hide your commandments from us. In the closing lines, Parsha Ekev. I'll, go, I'll read these to you and translate them sort of into English. But, because it's from Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 23 through 25. And it basically reads as this. And I'll kind of throw, if, as, and when you carefully shmar, uh, guard and keep and treasure all these commandments that I enjoin and challenge you to, to build and make, to love the Holy One, your God, and to walk in all of His ways, and to hold fast to him. Then, in that situation, the Holy One will drive out all the nations before you, and you will dispossess greater and mightier peoples than you yourselves. And every place that the sole of your foot treads will be yours, from the wilderness and Lebanon, from the river Euphrates, or Euphrates as it's often called today, even to the western sea will be your border. And no man will be able to stand against you because the Holy One will put the dread of you and the fear of you upon all the land where you tread, as he has said to you. That was the conclusion of our last segment of Moshe's discourse, his How to Build a Kingdom of Heaven, Centered Society on Earth discourse. And so now we're ready to begin with Parsha 11.26. Here we go. Anochi no nechim I set before you, behold, I set before you uh, today. Bercha ukala, uh, a blessing and a curse. Et ha bracha, that is the blessing, asher tishmeu el mitzvot Adonai Elohechem, and when you shema the mitzvot of the Holy One, asher anoki metzave et kem hayum, which I enjoin and, and challenge you to do this day. Ve'et ha chalala, and the curse, im lo asher tishmeu el mitzvot al Adonai Elohim. When you're, you shema the mitzvot of the Holy One, do not shema the Holy One of the Holy One. Vesartem min haderek her anoke metzave et kem hayim, which I have enjoined you and challenged you to do this day. La lachet achare Elohim acharim asher lo yidatim and you begin to follow instead after gods or authorities that you are not supposed to be following after. So, here we are. This is how it all starts. This is the Kingdom of Heaven Scented Society blueprint being downloaded with the perspective of what do you see when you look at the world before you? What do you, what perspective, what set of lenses do you use? He says Moshe would tell us that our day of incredible opportunity for Kingdom influence is coming. It is at hand. It's right here. But what will we do with the opportunity? Are we ready? Do we have enough downloads from heaven and enough resolve from deep within our awestruck heart to be able to do what we're called to do? Have we caught the inspiration of and are we currently flowing in the Kedusha energy of the Devarim, the Mitzvot, the Mishnatim, and the Hukim downloads that the Holy One has been given to us since the Exodus took place? I'm going to check and see, make sure I'm still 
online. I am. Hallelujah. That's good. Now let's move on to the next part of our discussion. There are two general pathways in life, Moshe would have us know, and I think uh, Yeshua taught this also in the, the narrow road and the broad road discussion. There are two general pathways of, of life that call to human beings at all times. Whatever it may look like uh, to our natural eyes, which are colored and, 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 and tainted, corrupted by our flesh instincts, appetites, and urges, and that sort of thing, and by our pseudo-intellectual predispositions. Whatever our fleshly urges, appetites, and desires whisper to us, and whatever our narcissistic emotions scream at us, and whatever our prone to folly pseudo-intellect pontificate to us, the choice is always before us. The choice of the way of blessing, Hebrew bracha, uh, that is found in the covenant lifestyle that Torah describes that Moshe has been laying out for us. And the choice between that and the choice of the way of cursing, or Hebrew kalala, the way that's found among the lawless, loveless, godless nations. And even those who pretend to be God-fearing, but who don't live like they're God-fearing. So in Moshe's come up here and see what I see discourse, the first part of it this week, we're going to be talking about shifting our perspective on the things of life and acquiring a kingdom worldview. We're talking about diverging pathways from the ways of the rest of the world, not acting, looking, behaving like them in strategic particulars, and then therefore visualizing and therefore drawing people toward different destinations than the people of this earth do. We're gonna be talking about that which has no place and that, on the other hand, that which must exist if we're going to have a kingdom of heaven sent to society. Some things have no place there and some things must exist there. And then finally, we're going to talk about the city and the great celebrations of our king and of the people of the great king. Basically, what this discussion of Moshe and Parsha uh, consists of is a discussion of eight areas of strategic divergence from the peoples of the earth in eight main ways. He's going to talk more in the weeks to come, but to begin this process, he's going to lay out eight different areas where we are supposed to look significantly different, behave, think, perceive, uh, approach life strategically different than the ordinary people of this earth. We are not in the same boat and we are not of the same ilk as, as those who are caught up in their flesh and their pseudo intellect and their nephesh, their mind, their will, their emotions. We are people of the neshama. We are people of the inbreathed breath of the creator of the universe, the eternal spark of life that he placed in Adam and then every seed of Adam therefore. We are those who use that neshama or let that neshama arise in us to therefore put down the desires and the urges and the appetites and the instincts of the flesh and over, uh, transcend those things, and transcend the pseudo-intellectual ideas and opinions and attitudes and worldviews of the, of, the, of the fallen man. So what are those eight areas? If we have eight areas in which we're supposed to look and act and see and think completely different than the rest of the world, what are they? Well, the first one that Moshe is going to mention is our vision of what is the pathway to blessing and what is the pathway to curse. There is what I like to look, refer to as, uh, there are people who live a well-lived life. And I'm not mean that they may or may not have money, they may or may not have prestige or fame, they may or may not make a mark in their, in their chosen profession or occupation or vocation, but they live a well-lived life because they impact the people around them in a positive way for the kingdom's sake, and they begin to release uh, for a, a foundation upon which future generations can grow. They leave something behind of beauty. So what is our vision of a pathway of blessing, a well-lived life? And what is our vision of a pathway of cursing? In other words, leaving things worse for the wear, leaving the world worse, leaving the people we know worse for the wear. So this is our first issue. That we should have a different vision of what leads to blessing than most of the world does. What leads to a well-lived life than what most of the people of the world think? What is success? And what is fulfillment as opposed to what the rest of the world thinks. If you don't have this perspective, then when we go into the, the land, we go into the place where the Canaanites have, uh, and the ites of all the different varieties, 
have their have their way and what have they been doing what they've been doing to pollute the earth they will think well i'd like a little of that and maybe my idea of success can be based on what they think uh, well that's not the way it's going to be what is our vision of what is our pathway that we envision to blessing on the other hand what do you we think will lead us to curse this will be a great paradigm shift that we're called to make that's only the first of eight strategic areas of divergence covered in red what's the second one the second one is a very shocking one it is what is worship uh, every culture seems to have its mindset its idea of what worship is and consists of and what evidence is of what does it look like in real time well I, this is shocking because Unfortunately, I believe that the bodies of, of, of the Holy One, the body of Messiah, has taken on the cultural uh, ideas and, and thoughts of the world and the nations of the world and the, and the other religions of the world and other people of the world and have just tried to make those a little better and improve those things as opposed to having a totally different strategically diverging idea of what it means to worship and what it looks like and where and how and in what attitude and with what activities we are to make, do, build this thing called worship and service in a way that clearly separates us from other people. In other words, it's time the Holy One, I believe, would tell us to re-examine everything we think about worship, everything we do and, and call worship, everything we allow into our lives and label worship and reconsider it go back to foundation go back to his words and see if what we're doing is is or is not worship and the third area of diversion so first is, is vision of what is blessing and what is success and what is a pathway to a well-lived life and what's not and the second thing is what is worship how where when and what attitude with what activities are we supposed to do it according to God's plan. A third area of strategic divergence that Moshe will cover is uh, what is your go-to paradigm of God in the first place? It will, this will color a lot of what happens. Do you, how do you see God? Do you see him as some impersonal force? Do you see him as some sort of a angry, detached, uh, maybe capricious uh, deity, maybe like an alien of some variety. Well, how do you, or do you see him as the Holy One would have you see him? Which in this Parsha, Moshe is going to introduce the Father paradigm. This way, you think Moshe didn't, Yeshua didn't bring that into the world. Moshe brought it into the world. You, he, you are sons unto the Holy One. This is what he's going to tell us in this Parsha. What is your paradigm of God? Do you think he's mad at you? Do you think he's angry at you? Do you think he's angry at the world? Do you think he's he's uh, uh, wringing his hands in, in fear that somehow his creation's been polluted and destroyed and corrupted and, and we, we can't, he can't fix it? No, no. What do you think of the Holy One? Who, who is he in your eyes? And do you sense the fatherhood and the fatherly wisdom and the fatherly kindness that is in him and the fatherly design and the plan, strategy to bring this back to him? The fourth area of divergence, strategic divergence that Moshe is going to bring about is the issue of what is going to be our truth plumb line. Uh, what will be our, our, uh, our, our uh, search engine? <laughs> Whenever we need an answer or we want to dig a little deeper, where will we look? Uh, there are so many search engines on the internet today that you can use. But none of those are what the Holy One would have us see me as our go-to plumb line gold standard of what the truth really is. That is not found on YouTube, and it's not, even though I'm here, it's not found in, on, on Google. It's not found on Ask Jeeves. It's not found on any of the search engines of the, of the Internet. Where it's going to be found is in the Torah. He's giving these instructions for life. This is his manual for operation of life, human life, on planet Earth. So this is where the plumb line is going to be. Moshe is going to make clear that we need to understand that the Torah is always going to be our plumb line, our gold standard of truth. Nothing else can, accept, can take its place. This will differentiate us from other people who want to look to uh, science or want to look to sociology or want to look to psychology or want to look to religion or want to look to some other tradition. Something besides the Torah plumb line the gold standard of his 
mitzvot, his mishpatim, his hukim. In other words, in English, we wouldn't call those things his commandments, his ordinances, his judgments. So the fourth area of divergence is very critical. What is going to be your truth plumb line and dual standard? And a corollary of that is going to be, so, and that considered, how gullible and susceptible are you going to be to a deceiver and to deceiver hype, what I call deceiver hype. They make it loud, they make it noisy, they make it interesting. They draw your attention like sirens to, to falsity. What is going to be your level of susceptibility to deceiver hype? Because you see, if the Torah is your plumb line and your gold standard, you will not be susceptible at all. You are no, you will know better the instant when you hear it that this is not the part, this is not consistent with the Torah, not consistent with the gold standard the Holy One's given us for truth. How gullible, susceptible will you be to deceiver hype, to sacrament theology, to sacrament mindsets? Oh, I don't have time to get into this one, but this is this is a problem that we are not the Torah does not give us sacraments. So, so sacraments are some other form of religion. How, how, uh, how gullible and susceptible are we going to be to, to, to affection and, and sentimentality for religious symbols and artifacts? These are some of the issues and religious structures that we build in our local communities. What will be our, our, our susceptibility to these uh, deceptions and deception hypes? The fifth area of strategic divergence that the Holy One will call us to through Moshe in this week's Parsha are what we consider food and what we make the choice to abstain from and consider non-food so that we will be seen clearly as different and hopefully wiser than the rest of the world. They're drawn by appetites. They, they, their eyes make their stomachs start to water, their mouth start to water, their stomach start to ruminate. They, are, they deal with things that we don't have to deal with if, unless we just choose to. We have the neshama alive in us, and he considers food to be that which the Holy One's Word says is food. And it is not food if the Holy One's Word does not say it is. All of our life comes from the words of the Holy One. This is a strategic divergence, and this will cause us to look different, and, and our, our menus will be different. And uh, the, what we order at restaurants and cafes, if we go there, will be different than other people. And we will not be prisoners of bacon. We will not be prisoners uh, and captives of, 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 of shellfish. We, we will not do things that the Holy One has said are not food, not because we expect to earn some some favor or we're punished, being punished because we can't do what other people do, because we are people of the Holy One. And He has defined our diet for us, to for our best, to bring forth blessing in us and, the, and around us and the lives of people around us and the world around us. And to do this, we need to follow His patterns. And though we choose to follow His patterns and consider food, what He calls food. I told you these are somewhat radical. These are this is what the Torah is, and this is why what we usually see in the earth is a watered down, corrupted version that we really need to reset from. We need to come up here to Moshe. And what is the sixth uh, strategic area of divergence? Where we're supposed to think, act believe, perceive, and, and behave differently and speak differently than the world. Well, this is what we shall do with increase or income. Money for most people in these days, uh, but also the increase in flock, the increase of your herd, if you have agriculture, the increase of your field. What are we supposed to do with the things the Holy One allows us to, to possess, to, 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 to grow in? And he, he told us he would bless us Last week, he said that, that, uh, that he gives us the power to acquire uh, provision and wealth. And so what are we supposed to do with the increase and in the income? This is a critical divergence between us and the rest of the world. They have their ideas, the material ideas of what they should acquire, the, the spiritual ideas of what they have to throw into the, the, their, their idea of religion. But what, are, what does the Holy One say? What is the words of the Holy One about what we're supposed to do with our increase and our income? And what are, how are we to, uh, to manifest and what are to be our fiscal priorities? 
this is a very important thing. Let's look at the issues with the, the next issue, which is the seventh. How the seventh issue of divergence or place of divergence is how will we care for the poor, the widow, the foreigner, the fatherless, and the disadvantaged in our midst? This is going to set us apart as a society. We are not to act toward the poor and the widow and the fatherless and the foreigner and the disadvantaged in our midst and the, as the rest of the world does. We're not supposed to be people who make government policies and, and, and appoint people who, who, with, with a, to, to administer programs. We, what we are called to do is personally engage in very specific ways that the Torah tells us to do. Moshe is going to lay out a series of ways in which we are to care for the poor and the foreigner and the fatherless and the widow and the disadvantaged in our midst. And this is mission critical. If we don't do this well, it doesn't matter how good our theology might be. It doesn't matter how good our, our, quote, worship services might look to the outside world. If we don't take care of the poor and the disadvantaged in our midst the way the Torah tells us to, in the, in the very specific methodologies the Torah tells us to do, then we will not leave the mark on society that makes it a kingdom of heaven, scented society. And then finally, the eighth of the, of the, of the strategic areas of divergence that Moshe will talk to us about is what will be our rallying place? What will we rally around as a people? As how will we come together and and uh, and and break through, work through our differences, and reconnect with our that which unifies us, which is the Holy One? So, what will be our rallying place and our rallying protocols? When uh, will we meet at this rallying place? And what will we do together? that will bind us together and bind us to our king and keep the king's good news story fresh and alive, not only in our hearts and our lives, but in our families, in our culture in general, and in our communications with the nations. What will be our rallying place? Uh, what three times a year will we go up to our rallying place? Where will it be? And what will we do when we get together there? that will uh, keep the King's good news story fresh and alive. Well, these are the eight strategic areas of divergence. I hope as you have your time today to study and read you and, and just marvel at the beauty of Parsha Re'eh, it will stun you if you let it. It will take you and reset you back on the correct path, the pathway of true blessing, if you allow it to. Or you can say, that's just for another day. That's not for me. I just want a little convenient religion. I just want to go to my worship place, my local worship center, and have a good time and feel like I've done my duty. Or, or you can actually change. You can actually begin to do things the Holy One's way, on His timing, according to His protocols, with His results. The general premise of Moshe is come up here and see what I see discourse is that, beloved, the spectrum of our vision, what we see, what we have been looking at, choosing to look at, and what we've been choosing to focus on, and form opinions about, and make judgments about, and react emotionally to, all those things need a substantial upgrade. Hallelujah. Let the upgrade come. Let the vision flow. The, the, the proverb says that uh, without a vision, without this vision, particularly the vision of the Torah that Moshe shows us in Deuteronomy in Parsha Re'e and following. Without this vision, the people go adrift. They, they, they just, it says perish in the English, but the word doesn't mean to die necessarily. It just means to start drifting, start wandering, to go without any moorings. We need a substantial upgrade in the way we see, the way we look. So what does Moshe see that we do not? He sees a blueprint unfolding before his eyes for a kingdom of heaven sent society that is built around a love of the Holy One and around a city of light set on a hill. Yes, I'm talking about Jerusalem. He's going to reference in this Parsha uh, this great city that is going to be our rallying point. 
not local fellowships, not local organizations, not local services, not anything. Our rallying point as a people will be one place. It is the place the Holy One, will, our God, will choose to place his character, his attributes, English, his name, and that will be the Jerusalem. We are supposed to build uh, this blueprint out of a kingdom of heaven synod society uh, from the center point, from the midpoint of a city of light set on a hill. And that is to be in contrast with the Babylonian towers, the, with the godless, lawless, loveless people groups obsessed with self-wills, structures and, and, and systems that they build. Uh, that is what we're supposed to do. We need to learn, uh, in Moshe's case, he's trying to tell us, from the Canaanites, bad example, from the Canaanites, bad example. They are the evidence of what not to do to build the kingdom of heaven sin in society. What not to do to release the vision of heaven for earth upon the peoples of the earth. So the question we have to ask, for them it was the Kanani. For us, it's the, it's the people of the secular culture or the religious cultures of all of our nations, of all of the nations. What do we need to learn from their bad example? Where did each of them go so horribly wrong that the land is vomiting, the earth is vomiting them out, as it says in the Torah. And what's happening is you see these kingdoms crumbling over and over again. They build, they fall, they, they, they come a couple hundred years at most, and then they begin to dissolve themselves and, and become a, a disunity, and then begin to hate each other, and, and, and then they begin to collapse, and the outside forces take them down. What is making them go so horribly wrong? Why are they so off the target of what the Holy One designed for a kingdom of heaven scented society. Why are we so lost in this world as opposed to following the will and the ways of our Creator as He designed them to for His purposes and for His plan? How can we keep from making the same mistakes that the nations around us keep making over and over again? Well, Moshe's going to say many things. Those eight areas of divergence are very important. One thing he's going to say is that we need to have some place important to go and a highly inspiring reason to go there. We need to do that or we're going to have some real problems choosing the pathway on which we travel. If we don't have somewhere important to go, we'll just choose any old pathway to get there. If we don't have a reason to go there, we'll, we'll just be distracted by things along the way. But if we have some place important to go and a highly inspiring reason to go and activities to engage in when we're there, we will begin to be able to see the beauty and the purpose of the pathway for which we have been uh, called. So this partial will introduce our spiritual center of gravity as the city of Jerusalem. It's the place where our king sits enthroned. It is the strategic beachhead of the kingdom of heaven on earth. So come, let us go up to Jerusalem to worship the king and do it his way. All right, I will go ahead now and just kind of talk to you in just a moment about this issue of, of who, what is going to be our gold standard. What is going to be our plumb line? Will it be the Torah or will we be listening to every other? Will we have our ear out for every other idea or concept or movement out there in the world? The Holy One talks a lot about it in this Parsha through Moshe about the false prophet and the, and the doer of, of signs, the, the one who does signs and wonders. Now, this is a key because what he's basically talking about is those things which capture human attention, particularly a pseudo intellect, but they, they will either draw you closer to the Holy One or they'll take you further away from the Holy One. It's so what the Holy One is saying through Moshe in this Parsha is that be very careful with all the hype of spirituality and religion. It goes everything from, from the Canaanites way, which is almost pay, is pagan in its, its origins, uh, from the standpoint of they don't worship the one true God, and they don't sense the beauty of the majesty of heaven and the plan that he has for the earth. They do things based on their selfish uh, ideas, their, their superstitions, their pseudo-intellectual predispositions, and, and their, their, their ease of sacrament and, and local meeting focus where they can just do little stuff and think they can get by with that. That's the problem of most. And then the, there's the, someone will always arise out of that kind of a mentality 
that has the, a new thing, uh, a fad, uh, a, a new, uh, boy, they pull out things like uh, the prayer of Jabez or something. They pull out something, maybe yet somewhat in somewhat of Holy Writ or just some new idea out of psychology, uh, you know, some new fad uh, diagnosis and, and prognosis and, and uh, positive thinking protocol, something that will sound good, that will attract our attention, or that will actually have some shines that it seems to be working. And then as it rolls off, it says, therefore, you don't need to follow the Torah. The end of their result will always be, therefore, come follow me, follow this way, do this spiritual high hype thing, and you won't need to follow the Torah anymore. Well, that's what we're going to see come arise. And the Holy One through Moshe is saying, no, your gold standard is always the Torah. If it is not inconsistent with the Torah, then do not listen to it, do not follow it, reject it, turn away from it. That's the pathway that will cause you and lead you to destruction, lead you to where you are no longer influential for the kingdom. And you begin to filter out and become like the nations before you, which have collapsed and fallen and always will do so. So if you hear anybody tell you that you don't need to follow the Torah, that the Torah has been done away with, that the Torah is somehow not, that is for another day, another people, another group, understand what you've just encountered. You've just encountered the way of the serpent. You've just encountered a lawless, loveless, godless person who may masquerade as being the most spiritual person you know and may seem to have some evidence of that in their lives. But if their message is, you don't need the Torah. Step away from the Torah. Follow after these other ways of doing things. Then, beloved, that's the first key to know you're on the wrong pathway. Second thing I'll talk briefly about is the Holy One's plan for dealing with the poor, the disadvantaged, the foreigner, the widow, the, the fatherless, the Levite, the ones who do not have the, the access to the full panoply of blessings that... Uh, the rest of the of, could, are supposed to have. How do you view them? Do you see them as a nuisance? Or do you see them as a gift? Do you see them as, as a blessing? Do you see them as, a, as an opportunity to, to actually practice what you preach and do what you're called to, to do and be who you're called to be? Do you see the things that you have been given materially as yours? Or do you see them as things you are stewarding? Things that you're called to uh, account for if anything is placed in your hand, you are called to account for it to the Holy One. You have, I call it being on a clock, actually. Every blessing you receive, monetary, physical, and anyway, is a blessing that's on the clock. You are now uh, charged with it, and you have a responsibility to increase it, disperse it, like the, the parable Yeshua taught of the talents. Uh, every blessing is like a talent. And what are you going to do with it? And find a way to make it better. And that's usually the people, the places are the poor, the disadvantaged, the widow, the foreigner, the, the fatherless, the Levite. These are the people that and the areas you're supposed to go to. The Holy One will talk about how you use the increase uh, in income of your land and of your, of your bodily uh, efforts, your work. And, and he's going to talk to you about the tithe, the, the ma'aser. And this is one of those areas that's so badly misconstrued. Uh, deceivers have taken use of this phrase and have made it a god uh, unto itself. That somehow there's some supernatural trick to the tithe. Well, the tithe is designed for the kingdom's purposes. And it's not supposed to go to some local organization or entity or 501c3. Uh, it's an IRS in the United States, IRS uh, exemption uh, section. It's not, not supposed to be that. It's supposed to be geared toward taking care of the poor, the widow, the foreigner, uh, the, the disadvantaged, and also toward sponsoring uh, people to go up to Jerusalem for the three times a year. The, the month of Aviv for Passover, the month of Nisan, of Sivan for uh, Shavuot or Pentecost, and the month of, uh, of Tishri, or seventh month of the year for the High Holy Days, and particularly the Feast of Sukkot. These are the rallying times, and we're supposed to take the poor, the poor with us, sponsor ourselves and those, and then also take care of during the two, two of the three years. And I just encourage you to read the Torah's portions about what the tithe consists of, and chapter 14, and, and let it shock you that this is not what you thought.
This is not what the world and the religious of the world tell you about. Let the Torah talk to you about what the tithe is and why you are to do it and how you are to do it. Well, beloved, I'm going to go ahead and, 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 and end our session this morning. I pray you've been blessed. I pray you've been challenged. That's more important than you being blessed because I believe in the challenge will come the blessing. Uh, he sets before us today a blessing and a curse. A bracha or a chalala. Which will be the way? Which way are you going? Which way do you want to go? And what is your chosen destination? What do you want to do with your life? What do you want to do? as you cross your Rubicon. Shabbat Shalom. See you next week.